We begin tonight with some breaking news of a grass fire in Barber County. Here's a video of what the fire looked like earlier today when it started. The here and now of climate change is becoming more apparent throughout the plains as wind-blown wildfires advance rapidly through dry vegetation and dust storms remind us of cataclysmic conditions in the hot, dry years of the dirty 30s. Farmers and ranchers and others in rural communities must contend with sporadic rainfall as droughts are punctuated with occasional heavy downpours. I think that we're in an age that we're going to have to deal with these, these extreme events. Whether we have a drought and then we have a 10 inch rainstorm event in a six hour time period, uh, that's probably going to be our new normal. In the years he worked with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, K-State agronomy professor Chuck Rice focused on the agricultural dimension of the changes we're dealing with. The main message hasn't really changed. Um, so at least from the agriculture sector is that agriculture plays a key role, but it plays a, a unique role because it's a emitter of greenhouse gas emissions, but also is a sink through carbon sequestration. So it's unique is that we need to reduce our emissions in the agriculture sector, but also enhance those carbon sinks. A significant part of Rice's research has explored the ways that farming practices can be modified to mimic the ecology of a native prairie. I mentioned earlier that part of my research has been on understanding the tall grass prairie ecosystem, and particularly the soil and the microbial. So if you look at this prairie, it's climate resilient. You know, the, the soils here on the prairie are very well structured, so they can absorb these high intense rainstorm events. And so by applying like no-till systems, cover crops, certain crop rotations, we can enhance the fungi in the soil to build a, rebuild the soil structure. And so it is more climate tolerant, climate resilient, just like the prairie. A lot of the things that we're talking about, climate smart ag or soil health practices, uh, the new term now is regenerative ag. But traditionally, ag has been intense cultivation tillage, but we're seeing now a shift to less disturbance, no-till, uh, reduced tillage agriculture, and that's really, really critical. And with that and the opportunities to intensify and diversify the ag systems, there's an opportunity to sequester carbon. It's really a win-win situation because if I can get more carbon in the soil, then I improve that soil, and now the term is soil health. I make it healthier, more productive. I've benefited the environment, and by making that soil healthier, I make it more climate resilient. It can hold more water. It can handle the intense rainstorm events that we've had. And then when we have these dry periods, it can supply that water for growing the crop. We've got to focus on that, on, on capturing those long days of sunlight to, as he said, to pump carbon into the soil, to feed that biology, to, to make it darker, to cycle nutrients, to do all the things that it does. Organizations such as No-Till on the Plains and the Kansas Soil Health Alliance host field days like this one on the farm of Darren Williams near Waverly, featuring educational presentations by a specialist associated with the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Chuck Rice sees this as being a critical component of the ongoing transition to climate smart agriculture. When you do no-till and crop rotations, you, you have to change your whole mindset and it changes how you apply your fertilizer, how you uh, do weed management. So it's not just plant no-till, it's, it's a, a systematic change. And consumers are now asking for uh, these climate smart practices, the carbon footprint, the environmental footprint. The time is ripe to make a transformational change in our ag food system. In regard to greenhouse gases emitted by agriculture, Professor Rice expresses particular concern for methane, which is much more potent than carbon dioxide in heating the atmosphere. He notes that agriculture accounts for about half of all methane emissions. And that's the one that right now is the hardest to manage for. It's gonna take some future research and development 
to reduce those methane sources, particularly in, in cattle. But there are some things, breakthrough technologies, fundamental science coming down the pipeline in the last few years to help reduce methane emissions in cattle. So there are some newer technologies that are going to be coming to the market soon. One will be marketed as Bovair, and it's a direct inhibitor of methane emissions, and we've seen it be pretty successful in beef operations and dairy operations as well. And there are some other technologies like seaweed, everybody likes to ask me. An assistant professor in the College of Agriculture at K-State, Logan Thompson specializes in sustainable beef production and is at the forefront of research on methane. For the beef industry, a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions come in the form of, of methane, what we call enteric methane emissions. That's a, just a byproduct of, of the natural fermentation process that occurs in the rumen. Uh, the rumen is, is the first compartment of a four-chambered stomach. So that's what ruminant animals are, and it's a, just a large fermentation vat where they take energy or, or feedstuffs that we can't use, so complex carbohydrates, chiefly cellulose, from plants, and they convert it into usable end products, right, for them, so to meet their growth needs or maintenance needs or anything like that. But that methane is produced as a byproduct, and when it's eructated out, most of it comes out of the front end of the animal, 90-96%. It does go into the atmosphere where it is a potent greenhouse gas, or more specifically, it traps a lot of energy in the atmosphere before it's broken down. It has a relatively short lifetime in the atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide. The, the key for us as an industry as it relates to methane is that, that if you just think of it as its structure, carbon and then four hydrogens, that carbon, right, it's an energy loss from the diet that that animal could, if we could retain it, improve its performance. So by reducing methane emissions, we might be able to A, improve the animal's performance, and B, for society at large, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and overall environmental impact. Something that shocks a lot of people is that most of our emissions actually come from grazing systems. Right? They don't come from the, our feedlot operations or confinement operations. Most of it's coming from grazing systems, which most people assume to be good and sustainable, right? But when we break down what drives methane emissions, it's level of intake and quality of the diet that the animal consumes. So the grass that you see if you drive across Kansas, you see these beautiful prairies or improved grasslands. While it looks good, it's a relatively lower quality diet than those animals would receive in confinement. And what we're looking at in those type of production systems is how do, how do management changes impact greenhouse gas emissions and overall ecosystem health, right? So one thing we're examining is how does rotational grazing play a role in that? The, the thought being if you move animals more frequently and get more even distribution of grazing across uh, an operation or a ranch, you're able to consume more forage at a state of, of what we call regrowth, where the overall quality of that forage is higher. Right? And we have some data uh, that's preliminary where we have seen that we have been able to reduce emissions by adopting that sort of rotational management strategy in, in different regions. Even rotational grazing, however, does no good when the rains don't come. And when drought conditions persist over a longer period of time, as is happening more often with the changing climate, producers are sometimes forced to sell their cattle simply because they don't have enough grass or forage to feed them. I was talking with a, a rancher down in North Texas um, very recently who had to liquidate his entire herd due to drought uh, up there. And then wildfires are also impacting those communities. We had some bad wildfires here in Kansas last summer. And then my previous stop in Colorado, we had wildfires there too. So drought and wildfires and water savings, that's what producers are asking about. Cattle and grazing ruminants at large are natural components of grassland and rangeland ecosystems. And by grazing those ecosystems, we're maintaining that overall health and function. Right, and we're also able to manage for wildlife habitat. By and large, we're seeing a lot of change. Producers are asking questions, and I, I think that we're making considerable progress towards capturing some carbon reductions. I think that we will improve our overall sustainability.
That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. You can find us on Facebook, where the conversation continues in a group called Hot Times in the Heartland, and watch more videos by way of our website at prairiehollow.net. Hope to see you there. This program is made possible with support from Diane Shoemaker, encouraging creative, compassionate, and equitable solutions to the challenges we face. By the R.M. Jory Donor Advised Fund, in memory of Carol A. Jory. By Richard Porter and Porter Cattle Company. By the Nature Conservancy in Kansas. And by Footprints in Lawrence.